Hi, everybody. I was going to start with something hidden under the chairs here, but I'm kind of glad I didn't go that way uh, today. Um, uh, I'm, St I'm Steve Peters. I, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about, I I'm, an, I'm an experience designer, a transmedia experience designer. And that's one of those things where, you know, you sit down next, some, next to somebody on the, air, on the plane and you kind of get to chit-chatting and, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a transmedia experience designer. And they always kind of give me this look. And I kind of realized, why? is Somebody said, well, they probably think you produce porn. And I thought, <laughs> that explains a lot that's happened to me. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about how the, the, the transmedia designer in a project that is kind of a, a as opposed to what, what Flint was talking about, a, a franchise transmedia project, uh, in a project that is kind of a one one story told in a transmedia way, and some of the some of the things I've done, what that role is, and how it how it's very very similar in a lot of ways to what a film director does, and uh, we're we're kind of at the cusp of this new you know tipping point in entertainment, and um, there actually are a lot of similarities. Uh, before I get into that, um, just to let you know a little bit, everybody, the people on the plane notwithstanding, ask me the kind of things that I do. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate to uh, be, have been involved in some of the, the kind of the larger transmedia projects over the last, well, since, gosh, since 2003, I think. Uh, most recent, which was probably heard of The Dark Knight, we did a big uh, uh, 18, 14 month uh, alternate reality game leading up to the premiere. Uh, before that, I was involved in some stuff for the Pirates of the Caribbean. We did a little kind of a transmedia-ish kind of game based in I Am, which was kind of fun. Uh, Watchmen, we did a fun kind of um, uh, voice recognition telephone kind of talk to one of the characters and watch things happen on your screen. And really early on, we were talking about, Flynn was talking about fan fiction. Uh, I did an indie project back in 2003 that was based in the Matrix universe. And in fact, we had a team, we kind of did it for the love of it. We, we were just kind of, uh, because we loved where this was going, we thought, and I had heard from the grapevine that there was not going to be any sort of alternate reality game going along with the Matrix, so we thought, aha, we'll do one ourselves. And we were very careful not to step on specific IP, but we did such a good job that millions of hackers from around Europe were trying to break our game, and we kind of rethought what, what we were doing there. Uh, but that's, that's, that's one of the more kind of fan fiction-based ones. Also have done things uh, that are more... Um, that are not related to film or television, uh, games related. Also, we did a project for Nine Inch Nails a few years back called uh, Year Zero that was really kind of interesting. It was kind of a native transmedia project in that it was uh, conceived as um, all part of the art for that for that album that was released. Um, so all through my life, before that I did, before I got into transmedia in 2001, we didn't even call it that back then. We thought, you know, they were just kind of this weird cool internet-based scavenger hunt kind of things. And this was back in the day when you were, you know, on dial-up modems in 2001 and just didn't even know really what was happening. Before that, I was a music producer. I, I was a composer, uh, did stuff for video games, uh, stuff like that. And it all goes back, and I was trying to re realize how I got into all this. And, and it all goes back right to the very beginning, I think, where <laughs> I was a roller coaster operator back... <laughs> And I've enjoyed taking people on rides ever since. That's kind of been the, look how cute that guy is. Isn't that, that's just, I love the, I love the green pants. That's, that's the best thing. Um, so that's, that's the, so I'm going to tell you why I think that, that uh, a transmedia uh, experience designer is kind of the next gen film, film director. And, um, but before we do that, let me talk about my definition of things, my definitions of transmedia. Um, I like to call things alternate reality entertainment, uh, what we're doing, because that's kind of what we're trying to strive for. You know, we're still trying to, we were talking, I was talking to, to Michelle, we need to come up with a better name, a good name for this, you know, like blog didn't exist, or, you know, what were some of the other things we were talking about, the, the words, I'm not going to bring up the word you brought up, I don't even, there was an Australian word, what was that, that was... Bogan? Yeah, I don't know what that means. I was told not to, yeah. Um, but there's words that, there's words that are kind of new words, and we don't, we haven't come up with that yet. So, but for now, alternate reality, entertainment, transmedia, uh, you know, we'll just call it that for now. So what's my definition of this? So uh, we talk about it being an overlay of the entertainment space onto the real world. That's kind of the cool part of the technology that we're afforded now with mobile and with, you know, web and with live events and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we talk about how it interacts with you through your phone and your email, your browser, and even on the street where you live, things could happen down the street. Um, I remember 
uh, there was a project that I wasn't involved with in that, in that uh, I got a call uh, from a friend of mine who was playing it. It was for uh, a Terminator TV show in the States. They said there was something buried in the park uh, down the street from my house, conveniently. And um, so I took my daughter, who was 14 at the time. I said, come on, you want to go down the street and we'll dig in the park. We'll find this thing. And, and uh, she goes, okay. So we go out and it's raining and we look for this thing. And, and uh, she finds this thing buried in the park. And I'm, I'm worried. It's raining. It's cold. I'm thinking, this, I, is she going to be okay? She gets back in the car. She finds this thermos with this digital camera with it. And she looks at me in the car. She's so excited, stopping when She goes, Dad, I feel like I'm in a movie. And I thought, that's the golden moment right there. That's what we're striving for, to put the audience in the story, to make them feel like the hero. She opened up. She had a great time. It didn't matter the wetter it was, the more rainy it was, the better for her. She just, she just loved it. Um, so it's not limited to just movie screens, television sets, or game consoles. This is all pretty complicated. It's hard to explain to people. So I, I, I want to make it simple, sim simpler here for you. And up till now, here's a way to think of it. Before you went to the story, if you wanted to be entertained, you'd go to the bookshelf, you'd pick a book out, you'd go to the TV set, turn it on, you'd go down to the cinema, you'd buy a ticket, uh, you go to the ball game, you go to the campfire and sit around it and tell stories. Now the story can come to us. Uh, we're, we're at a great time in kind of entertainment history, in storytelling history, where really for the first time we can tell stories that really surround the audience, that really go and hit them where they, where they live. So, so let's take a look at the process, uh, first of all, before I can define kind of how uh, what I do as an experienced designer is similar to um, a film director. Let's look at the process that we go through if we want to uh, develop um, an alternate reality game or a transmedia entertainment project or whatever it is we're going to call it. We should have a cherry ripe contest to see somebody come up with a great new term. I would, I would go for that. And uh, I love the idea with the, Am the Amelie uh, thing. That's a very transmedia. I watch that film and I think this is a trans. She's walking down the street. The phone rings. She picks it up. There's magic. Magic happens. That's like a personification of transmedia. Um, so let's take a look at uh, if we were going to say you want to develop one of these one of these things that we're calling transmedia. What do you need? What kind of team do you need to put together? And this is from my experience uh, in, in past projects. Obviously, the first things that you need are writers, uh, a team of writers to come up with a story. Because without story, uh, the, what's the point? I mean, to me, I've I've done kind of advertising for transmedia projects, and and but my my heart and my my passion is as a storyteller. I want to tell a good story. And so the transmedia process is more of a means to that end, to tell a good story. And there's some very big and obvious benefits to uh, this thing that we're, we're calling transmedia. Uh, you need experienced designers. That's me. Uh, we'll go into what that means. Uh, more one, one or more uh, is a good idea, depending on the scope of the project. You need a producer. We all love producers because... I know for me, I like to just like think of stuff and make other people do things to make it work, you know. And the producer is the guy that you know, or or girl, gal who who makes things happen, you know. And a great producer is a great asset. And a transmedia producer is a very very special animal because they all of a sudden they know how to make things happen across a multitude of media that aren't used to kind of talking to each other. Uh, obviously, if you it's there's a web-based component, you need graphic artists. Uh, along with that, you need the IT guys, the programmers, the guys that set up those those uh, telephone systems to do voice recognition and trigger a f uh, an email that goes out. You know, I don't know how that stuff's magic to me. Um, you need those guys to make that that happen. Uh, and then, if you're very lucky and if you have the time, you need some sort of QA system and some some testing. Although, uh, in a lot of kind of the real-time projects that we do, the alternate reality games, that's not really feasible to a certain extent because you kind of have to push it live and then you kind of test it as it's out there uh, because you can't, you know, load test it and you can't figure out what a hive mind of people is going to do. So, but in reality, the core of this this uh, this team, much like the core of a film, is the the writer, the producer, and in the case of film, the director, on the case of alt, uh, alternate reality games and transmedia stuff, is that experienced designer. It's those three people, that core, uh, that core team, that everything else can kind of flow from. Um, I know for me, I work very, very closely with the writer. It's a very um, 
synergistic experience when when we're writing the story uh, sometimes the writers will come up with great ideas as to how to deliver or they'll have specific ideas as to how they want to deliver a certain piece of content uh, or perhaps then I can go back to the writers in the in the writing process and say hey you know what I'd love to do this thing but we need a character who's going to enable this to happen and can can so and so have a sister who maybe goes to high school and has friends that yeah and, and so it's it's a very big give and take process and so the writers especially in the in the early stages the pre-production part of things the writer and the designer work very very closely together spend hours on the phone together um, and just kind of come up with forming this whole thing from the very beginning so um, so let's take a look let's uh, let's look at your classic how how is an experienced designer like a film director so we've got your you, there's some great film directors and I don't want to compare myself to these great people who are geniuses so but forgive me it'll seem like that I am doing that right now um, but just just for the sake of illustration you know uh, we've got great film directors and we've got these kind of cool shadowy uh, experienced designers um, how are they the same how are they different well okay as I mentioned in the very beginning uh, a film director works very closely with the writer to determine how the story gets told. Uh, much like the director gets together with the screenwriter and they talk about this, the whole, the, the theme, what they want to accomplish, the look, you know, everything like that. Experience designer, very, very similar. That's kind of where things are pretty much exactly the same right from the get-go. Um, I've spent I learned how to use Skype doing a, pro a project because my writers were in Texas, I was in California, and we just spent hours every day on the phone just kind of hashing through every, every scene and every piece of the story and just kind of, and it was constantly, constantly morphing. And as sometimes you'd start off the project, you didn't know how it was going to end. And sometimes you'd reach a point in the middle because of these pushed production schedules. You'd reach a point where you realized, oh wait, we need to do something here, and then you'd have to backtrack and go uh, to write to change the story to to make this other thing work. That's part of what we're doing when we're when we're in a certain to a certain extent we're making this up as we go. Anybody that tells you they have all the answers for transmedia, they they got a I don't know, they got a book to sell you. I don't know. It's just I, I don't want to disparage anybody selling books because books are great. But we're it's a very experimental. It's still we're still in a very formative stage, and that's a good thing. Uh, the second thing that uh, uh, a film director does these are just very very general generalized statements they want to they take the script and they turn it into a series of shots or a series of scenes uh, very similar similarly an experienced designer will take the story and and will will just kind of distill it to a, a series of story points I, I like to take the story and just say okay let's make a bullet point list out of this what's happening what's doing what once we figure out the timing of the thing what's happening on this day if it's a real-time thing what's happening a week later you know how is this all gonna work so we're taking the story and we're just kind of making it into little bits that we can we can work with then the big thing that's really interesting is uh, the next thing a director does is he'll work and he'll decide, you know, for each scene, what are the camera angles he's going to use? What are the lens effects? What is the, what is the feel for the scene going to be? How's it going to be broken up uh, into shots? Um, this is where it gets a lot of fun for the experience designer. This is where we then take these bullet points and these story points and we say, okay, how is it going to best be told on what platform? What platform organic to the story is going to work the best? Is it going to be, you know, a blog that somebody's telling a story? Please don't do that because it's really, really boring to read. Um, or is it going to be, you know, just straight video, omnipotent camera? Or is the camera going to live in the fiction? Is it going to be audio that's found? Is it going to be an email? Is it going to be a phone number that people call and they get to hear a phone conversation? Uh, is it going to be a, some sort of live event? where something's happening uh, down your street and you can actually go and interact with actual characters from the game. Uh, that's, that's, that's really, this is where it gets very, very different than film because all of a sudden we're literally taking the idea of what does entertainment look like when it doesn't have to live just on this one screen? What does entertainment look like when really this, the world is your canvas and, and we're making that real? And so Part of that is just coming up with these conceits and your internal rules for your, your universe. How is your universe going to work? Where does that fourth wall kind of lie? Uh, the fourth wall is very permeable in, in transmedia. You know, the, the, it can all live in the player's universe or straddle it and, and stuff like that. So let's just take a second here and I want to take you through some of the platforms, some of the delivery mechanisms for storytelling that um, 
we've been able to use in the past that have been a lot of fun and very effective. Obviously, uh, the telephone is a great way. It still has a lot of bang for your buck when people get this phone call in the middle of the day and it's the game or it's the story calling them and invading their world. Uh, fax machines, we've used fax machines in the past, obviously emails, uh, we've used stuff like that. Um, chat messaging, uh, there was one game that we did uh, where we actually used um, an online poker game. Uh, we took an app. This is back in the heyday when poker, online poker, was really, really big. Remember that year when that was the case? <laughs> Uh, and then all of a sudden it became spam and, and it went away. Uh, we took a, a, a poker site. We had an actual functioning poker site. This is for a project with 42 Entertainment called Last Call Poker. And it was a real functioning poker site, but it was haunted. And you would sit down and you never knew. Somebody, a dead person or a historical character could come in and you would sit and play poker with Wild Bill Hickok or something. And so this story went, it was part of a promotional uh, game for an Activision uh, Western uh, first person shooter game. Um, I don't know what that is. I can't see that. Oh, this is, this is, is what? Yeah, there's, there, yeah, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, HTML code stuff hidden in the code. There's obviously there's there's uh, I am uh, there's uh, people can find documents can find things hidden in uh, uh, one of my favorite things was was using these kind of fake incident reports that were automatically generated by this building to be able to see when doors were opening and stuff like that. And there's a really interesting way that you can tell a story using the, using that stuff. Um, that's uh, money. We've told money. We've told stories with money. Believe it or not. Um, I'll go into that later, how that worked. Uh, found, found photos, found documents. That's an obvious, uh, an obvious way to do it. People, the old idea of finding a cell phone and people look through it and there's, there's photographs on that cell phone. You can tell a story uh, using that. Uh, using computer widgets, there's kind of ways that you can do that to build a widget where it's always pinging home and when something happens in the story, something happens on your computer. Uh, another way with documents that's kind of fun, um, foreign languages is another great way to tell a, a fun story. The beauty of what we're doing when we're doing transmedia projects is that if it's global and it's a community-based thing, and I'll get into more about that later, is that you can keep things kind of in their native language and that's kind of part of the fun. You know, they find a, a document and it's, if it's in a, by a Russian character, it's in Russian and there's no subtitles. There's no subtitles in transmedia. I don't know. There could be. Who knows? Uh, uh, actual product, actual um, artifacts that are found. You know, they could go down to that park and find something. Uh, find somebody's uh, ID card that you've made, a prop that you've made. Music. We told stories through music, where where uh, messages are hidden in 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 the songs, in the notes. Um, just documents where people dig for stuff. You can find a wealth of stuff if you. If you look into like family trees, there's a lot of there. That's kind of a transmedia thing. You're learning a story as you delve into your family tree and find people's wedding certificate and stuff. There's a lot of stuff that you can tell by who got married, who was the witness at the wedding, stuff like that that can further your story. Skywriting. We've used skywriting as as part of our storytelling, which is kind of kind of uh, fun and interesting. Um, messages that are hidden, albeit in this case it was a enigmatic puzzle master that love to do strange things. So yeah, sky, uh, uh, skywriting is a, is a fun way to do it. Hidden USB drives. Uh, the Nine Inch Nails project that we did uh, had hidden USB drives that were hidden uh, in concert venues around the world. And when people found them, obviously, they were eager to find out what was on them. Uh, there was sometimes music. There was sometimes stuff hidden in the audio that if you look through a spectrogram analysis came, you know, there was, there was uh, messages or pictures, stuff like that. Billboards, we've seen the ever-popular uh, Lost uh, TV show had uh, oceanic billboards that were tagged. Uh, and um, there's one more. It's supposed to come up here. Why is it not working? It's probably a really, really big graphic. We still got billboards. Oh, there we go. Fireworks. I've actually hidden stuff in fireworks, which is really kind of interesting. Uh, in this particular one, you know, the the uh, the directions of the fireworks. Sometimes they made Roman numerals. Sometimes they went off in Morse codes. Sometimes they went off in shapes that then had to be. So that's kind of an expensive way to do it, but it, it's really cool. <laughs> Um, and you only get a chance to do it once. You don't get a chance to rehearse that one. So that's kind of nerve-wracking. Uh, maps is a fun way to do it. You know, we got GPS and location-based things. There's really interesting ways to tell a story there just by following uh, where somebody went throughout a day or a week. Um, again, live artifacts, we've done that. Live events, um, the police were there to protect these people. They weren't arresting any of these people. This is a shot from The Dark Knight, a, a big event that happened in, in Chicago. 
And then one of the one of the funner things, more f the, the the coolest things we did, if this this here comes, uh, we were able to do uh, architectural projection. We were able to put clues and story points on these landmarks around around the world. Uh, this is the Brandenburg Gate in 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 uh, Berlin. So there's really when we talk about the world being your canvas to tell the story it really is literally true I mean anything that you can think of it's fun to think of these things that aren't historically used as storytelling um, tools and figure out ways to use them as such and it's because that's how we tell our stories to ourselves in our everyday lives I mean there's evidence of how we live uh, you know there's receipts to where we go there's all sorts of kind of these archaeological things in our lives that we leave behind that if somebody were looking at them uh, can tell a really effective story uh, now I say that in these things can also be combined uh, there was one scene we did for a recent project that um, the audience first found a video that basically kind of set the scene, a chase video. Uh, later on, and this is a, an example of kind of non-linear storytelling, later on the audience was able to find um, a hidden audio file that then took, that was overlapping with the end of the video that they had just found and extended that scene uh, so that they understood what was happening after that. You may recognize this stuff, Christy. And then uh, later on, even after that, they were able to find a document that was basically a transcription of a telepresence, teleconferencing thing that they saw in the video that kind of ended up leading up to the scene. So as a way, here's, here's kind of transmedia in a nutshell right here. We've got, you know, a document one scene that takes place in a document that they find, in a video that they find, and in an audio piece that they find. Um, and once they find all, once you find all these pieces, it tells a very, very, uh, it's very compelling, it's very engaging to find this stuff, as opposed to just, it makes it really feel like it's coming alive. So, so that's, that's, um, those are the sorts of tools. Again, this is very general. There's, you know, the sky's the limit. Your, your imagination is the limit. And that's kind of the cool, fun thing about the way, where things are right now. Um, now let's get to a little bit more practical terms. Um, a film director uses storyboards a lot of time to help him, you know, create a scene and kind of, you know, visualize where things are going and, and what the pacing is of the, of the movie, et cetera, like that. Um, We'll use uh, uh, some similar stuff. We'll use, uh, uh, obviously, we'll use storyboards for video elements, but kind of the bigger picture of how things work, we'll use maybe flow charts to kind of keep the audience flow. It's very important to do to kind of keep a, a sense of uh, where the focus is. Uh, pacing and focus is a very big issue in transmedia. Uh, you want people to be looking in the right direction to be able to see what you want them to find, to see. Uh, and to be able to find the story that you want them to tell. So um, uh, using a combination, just as a uh, director, film director uses storyboards in conjunction with the script, I'll use or, uh, a, a combination of flow charts and design documents. So here's a sample of a, of a flow chart for uh, just uh, one piece of a transmedia project I did recently. And you can kind of, I don't know how well you can see it there, shows how, shows how, um, you know, players will find a, 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 see a video and they'll notice something in the video that will lead them to a website and then that will lead them to a, a phone number and stuff like that. Um, now there's an Australian flag there, see? I did, I did that on purpose. Um, this, this is a project where one of these characters uh, was from Australia. He had a Facebook account, so they find that and that leads to, to uh, somewhere else. So again, it's very important to know where your audience can go and how they're going to get there and what kind of obstacles may be in their way. And again, this is, we're talking in a very, I'm talking in a very specific kind of alternate reality game live event or real time uh, uh, experience here, and I'll get I'll get into that a little bit later. So, but that gives you an idea there. The Batman uh, uh, project, the, the the Dark Knight. This is just this. These are all the websites that were involved in that project over 14 months, and uh, so it was it was quite a lot. Uh, a very rich world that we kind of brought Gotham City alive very, via via various websites and events and phone numbers, etc. Then there's also, instead of a script, there's a, a master design document. So much like gaming, this is kind of where transmedia uh, kind of crosses with your game design elements. There will be a master design document that explains what, every app, what needs to be built and what needs to be done, whether it's an audio piece or if it's a website um, or if it's a video piece. And it'll include the scripts. It'll include if there's any sort of challenges, any kind of gates that, that the audience has to do in the meantime. Um, then the final thing that uh, an experienced designer or a, a director does, he kind of he oversees obviously the 
the the tone and the overall look and feel of the film. He wants to uh, make sure the set works with the set direction, the art designers to make sure the sets follow his vision, and he oversees post production, the editing, and and all that kind of stuff to make this this vision come alive. Uh, as, as an experienced designer, uh, yeah, the experienced designer is the one that oversees has to make sure that every asset that's created whether it's a digital asset uh, an audio asset um, a video asset any of these pieces uh, conforms to what his big vision for the project is and make sure that it works it doesn't break anything especially if there's like little puzzly elements involved and it's really easy to break stuff um, so in a lot of ways like I said there there are a lot of very a lot of similarities uh, to designing a transmedia project um, as, a, as opposed to being a film director. And again, it's, it's the medium dictates kind of the job description, right? And as the technology and the medium changes, uh, these, these uh, roles need to change. Like I said, the, the, the transmedia producer is a very different beast than, j than just you know, a film producer because now the transmedia guy has to have a grasp on not only video and, but also audio and photo assets and all these other things. Um, so I talked earlier about the, keeping that in mind, I talked earlier about the, the different kinds of experiences that, that we're able to do as uh, transmedia producers. And I like to uh, split them into two. And these are, again, very, very general. Um, there's the long-term kind of real-time event, like I, the, the Dark Knight thing was. It took place over 14 months. It's a huge community-based thing that happens when a week goes by in the game. In, in real world, a week goes by in the game. There are a lot of challenges to that. There's a lot of barriers to entry to that. Um, you have to have, if you don't have like this property like the Batman, you know, it's hard to uh, attract and maintain an audience for that. Uh, because it's a big ask. You know, you're asking people to invest a lot of time and energy into this. Um, conversely, there's also a way that you can take all the cool stuff that we've been talking about and condense it into kind of more of a 10-minute ish short form version that's kind of replayable that's kind of a, that can be played by one person as opposed to a big you know a, a big community um, I like to I like to look at it I like to call them you know args is the the first form and and we've been calling that that short form version rides because it's something that you know you get on and you enjoy it and you get off and you thought that was great and hey mom check this out and and it can be really effective um, the arg is more like uh, a live event it's like a rock concert you know it happens at one time in one place and with this community of people and if you miss it there have been a lot of great ARGs and they're, they're done, they're gone, you can't experience them anymore and that to me is a really really serious limitation of the alternate reality game because uh, if you missed it, you missed it. No, I wasn't at Woodstock. I'll never know what Woodstock was like. I can watch the films, I can watch the documentaries, but I can't. I'll never have. I'll never be able to experience it like the people that were there. Same thing with ARGs. Now I'm convincing. Now I'm comparing us to Woodstock. I can't believe. Um, but it, the, there's that similarity. I mean, we've all been to these, and, and a community does build up at these events. So, so the short form. There's a lot of pluses to that in that you're addressing these these issues of of uh, replayability and being able to, you know, have a shelf life. Um, you, with those in mind, ARGs and RIDES, there's also in what we do um, as it relates to TV and film, there's two general kind of timelines that we, that we can do, one of which is leading up to an event like the premiere of a TV show or a, uh, a film. Um, both of these ARGs and RIDES can be used in, in those cases. Um, Obviously, the ride's shorter, and you don't want to ride to be out there for you know 12 months. But uh, like I said, there's 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 benefits to both. Um, and then there's two. The other is to, in the case of like a TV series, to actually extend the universe of the story, the story world that's in the TV series, uh, to make it live and breathe in between each episode. Which I I really like this. Uh, there's a recent. How many of you guys seen, have seen the Sherlock? This is a a great show for one. It's one of my favorite shows out. Uh, but they've got some really interesting uh, transmedia components to that. And they're not, and it doesn't have to be, okay, like The Dark Knight was millions of dollars, right? And a lot of stuff. Uh, this stuff was pretty simple. I mean, and not expensive. It was basically, you know, some website content and stuff like that. Um, 
that basically told the story of what was happening uh, in between the episodes of Sherlock. And the interesting thing, too, is uh, the TV show referred back. They referred to each other. And so you could tell that they'd thought this out from the very beginning, and they'd written it into the script. Dr. Watson has a blog where he has to, you know, talk about everything he's experiencing, and it's a big setup. And so you go and you find out, no, he really does have a blog. Um, and, and then they refer to it back. Sherlock later, you know, kind of mocks him for some of the stuff he says. So it's really kind of fun. It's a very simple way to do it, but it was very, very effective, I thought. And, and uh, it was a lot of fun to go, oh, I'm going to check, and there's more story there. So it's a way that if you, if you take fans of your story, or you, even if they're not fans, and if they want more content and they want more story interaction, they can go out and find it. And it really does a really good job of doing that. So... Um, in that, you know, the, the limited series, three episodes. So there was kind of a real, real-time thing happening there. So if you haven't checked out Sherlock, I have no, I don't work for BBC or anything like that. Please do. It's a real, it's a really good, it's a really good series. Um, so that begs the question as to, okay, now we have all this stuff and we know what these roles are. Um, we're in an interesting place, and that's part of why we're doing the, you know, conferences like this. Um, historically, you know, I've heard it said, you know, we're transmedia is like we're standing at Kitty Hawk with the Wright brothers or whatever. But here's 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 the thing that you got to keep in mind, and here are the challenges as we move forward in, in thinking about developing stuff, and. And transmedia is cool because it's all about possibilities. It's not about limitations. You know, it's not about, you know, well, TV's done this way. Everything, you know, we're throwing everything off the table and throwing it all back on and just saying, here, what can we do with it? Uh, there are a couple things, though, to keep in mind. It's number one, the te technology and the form. They're not quite settled in yet. Um, by saying that, I mean that there's not... The technology is really getting close, but it's still changing so fast, right? I mean, Facebook wasn't around like two years ago, and yet now one in four page views in America is a Facebook page view. I mean, that's that's a big kind of change in the technology. Uh, the ubiquitousness of these these lovely phones that we've got that can do everything from, you know, translate stuff to take phone calls to, you know, play all of our music. I mean that's really changing how we use technology. So there's still some dust that has to settle there. And, and as a result, the form, the storytelling form, hasn't quite settled as far as what is the most effective, and I'm talking going mainstream here, because right now, even no matter what everybody says, there's still not been a transmedia project that's really kind of hit the tipping point and been, you know, the... The, the big brother of, you know, the thing that changed television or, you know, the thing that changes entertainment that brings a wide, broad audience. So we're still kind of waiting for that thing. Um, I liken it back to the invention of film. You know, the film projector camera was, was invented in 1894. But you didn't see movie theaters, like, spring up overnight. It took, you know, a decade for kind of that revenue model to kind of uh, settle in. And then in addition to that, it still took yet another decade before what we consider now, a lot of people look at, you know, the birth of a nation as far as filmmaking goes, is to be, it was a definitive uh, uh, film in that it, it set precedent for a lot of the techniques that we still use today to tell stories. So that was a 20-year period. So right now, it's a similar thing. You know, we look at the first arc, I want to add like Blair Witch Project or, or stuff like that, and you know, we're about 10 years in, right? The technology still needs to, you know, settle in. Uh, it's still not quite there. And that form, that storytelling form, isn't quite cemented in yet. And I, so I think we're still kind of in this middle, this middle stage. And to me, that's a really exciting thing because what that means is one of you guys, one of you here in this room, might come up with the, the definitive model for how best to tell stories using all of these techniques. So again... Um, the sky's the limit. It's all about possibilities. It's it's not about you know and 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 the challenge of coming up with well you know TV networks are used to building stuff that does this specific thing and costs this much and they know where all the money is going and they know what's paying for what and uh, film is the same way. The studios work a certain way to make a certain thing. I think it's going to take a new kind of studio, a new kind of of big department in a studio or something to be able to really just kind of work at this and say, okay, look, these walls are torn down. All these people that haven't been talking to each other uh, can now and should talk to each other. Um, and so what can we do with it? What can we make of it? And so um, 
that's it. I think, you know, the, that's how the future is. We're going to tell stories. This is it. This is how the future is going to tell stories. Transmedia is the future. And I, I really believe that with all my heart and soul because it has to change, and it is changing. It's just a matter of what are we going to do with it and who's going who's to come up with that cool, that big thing that's going to really make this thing uh, go worldwide and make everybody talk about it. So I guess I could take questions now. Is there time for that? I got time. Yes. Thanks for that. Fascinating. Um, just uh, there was a slide that you showed that had a document, a video, and an audio, and I'm really interested. Um, do the does your audience uh, get the same story points from each one, just a different experience of those story points, or it? Or, are they, or do they need all three to get the whole story? And which of those would you say is a more effective model at yeah, this point? <laughs> more effective. That's, that's a really good question. Um, in that particular case, it wasn't just, oh, here's a different point of view on the same events. Um, there can be some really interesting storytelling techniques, you know, ways to tell stories by doing that. But in this case, it was actually they were finding uh, a different time period that kind of uh, dovetailed with what they had already found. So the audio that they found was a continuation of the video scene that kind of cut off. You could actually hear the same audio uh, that was at the end of the video. And then, then later on, then you realized that the document that you found was a transcription of what you saw as these characters broke into this office and interrupted this teleconference. And you realized that what you found was the beginning of the teleconference. So it was like almost two different scenes intersecting. Um, as far as which is more effective, that's a great question, and, and a lot of people think that, well, video is king, right? Video is what you want to do because it can tell the stories most effectively. I don't agree with that. Um, I think there, it definitely has its place, but there's definitely times where it's more effective to, uh, to use just audio. Uh, um, we've done it in the case of, and the, the challenge there is, you know, you can either make it part of the fiction as to justifying why it's just audio or, or not. You don't have to. It can just be audio. Um, because there's something about those old time radio plays where you're just hearing things and you're hearing, and plus there's a budgetary consideration too, um, where you're hearing things, where your imagination can see things that would have been, number one, a lot tougher to produce, but it just really helps the imagination. Uh, there's a lot of fun to that. There's the game I Love Bees. I don't know if, the, if you know about it. The entire thing was, was an audio, was a radio play played out over pay phones around the world. And the whole thing was just audio. And it was, it was wonderful. And it's a lot of fun to go into the studio and go, hey, we're producing an audio, a, a radio drama. And a lot of people don't know how to do that anymore. And so you're kind of remake, we're, we're rediscovering the old uh, in that what's the effective way to do that. So yeah, there's something very effective about that. And even something simple as like hacking into somebody's email account and getting to see uh, the list of their emails, whether it's spam or uh, uh, you know an email from their wife saying, remember to bring home the milk. There's something about that, that kind of the voyeuristicness of that that is very, as far as developing, of developing your characters, it's very, very effective. It makes people really, we've had, we've had stories turn on people latching onto a character that we had no idea they were going to latch onto based on just by seeing this guy's email account. They just felt very connected to this person. Why? Because that's how we communicate with our friends. That's the exact way. And so they felt like this person was real. So it was a really effective way to do that. So, so yeah. Uh, oh, yes, um. with the mic. My name is Daniel. Um, the other two presentations have had some connection to role playing, so I want to bring a little bit of that in. It seems to me that perhaps an experienced designer's early sort of role was a dungeon master or a game master in a role playing game. Mine? Um, I just think that perhaps that's oh. an early an early incarnation of an experienced designer. But in yeah. terms of that, those sorts of games work really well when the person running the game has the capacity to really improvise and to immerse people in a world and. And, and you can have a whole set sort of script, but if the players decide to go somewhere mm -hmm. and you're able to go with them, even though you haven't necessarily thought about the fact that they might go to that cave and what might happen there, how much in what you've done have you got the capacity there sometimes to make some audio when the audience sort of seems to latch onto that email and go with that character? Have you, is that more difficult? Have you explored that sort of stuff? Very much. That's one of the definite... Um 
advantages that we've always touted saying that we can react to what the audience does in the case of alternate reality games that their your audience does something or latches onto a character that you didn't anticipate or they get stuck somewhere and didn't don't find this connection and miss a vital piece of information there's a lot of kind of tap dancing uh, live television it's almost like doing live tv in a certain way um we've historically said that we design out 80 percent and leave 20 percent to kind of be you know shaken out live and there there's there's really a good thing about that and that can be done obviously there's lead time involved if you need to re uh re-record an audio piece sometimes that's not realistic uh social media is a good a good way to do that now because uh, it can be real time you can you can really be light on your feet as far as that sort of thing goes twitter updates that sort of thing uh client is also a big issue how how long your approval loop is to get content approved so depending i've had clients where it takes a three-week process and i've had other clients where they're like yeah just do whatever you want so that's a big piece of it too uh the mic is here now steve i'm really interested in your core team of you know writer producer experience designer and i'm just wondering where the developer fits into that because in my experience you know the it program or developer actually has a huge impact on what can or can't be done in any given platform so very true where do they sit in your core team <laughs> uh we'll typically you know blue sky first and say you know it would be really cool if we could like put send clues out to everybody's toasters around the world and have it come out and it could say stuff and then we come back is that possible I and mean, no it's not but then you know um uh, yeah that that the the it the tech team is very very integral too outside of the kind of the the we'll have weekly meetings as we go and to make sure that we're not latching a core mechanic onto something obviously that can't that can't be done or isn't feasible within the scope of the budget or whatever um so uh it's a process yeah and it's it's a rolling process throughout the development of the thing uh if that answers your question I so imagine sometimes your become, oh, oh every time yes every time yes no no oh <laughs> sorry she got up okay <laughs> Sorry, um, lampoon him at lunch. 